It gives you an idea of the kind of capabilities that we have here and why we want to be interested in doing uh, doing this kind of work or helping out. So with that, I'll talk, turn it over to uh, Dr. Ray Chow, and um, thank you very much for coming. Oh, thank you, Greg, and thank you, Heidi, for inviting me uh, to this very interesting conference. Uh, first of all, I'd like to point out uh, a change in the title from what is uh, in your program. Uh, the program reads Experimental Demonstrations of the Dynamical Casimir Effect and Squeezed State Production Using a System of High Q Superconducting Microwave Cavities. I'm not going to say anything about squeezed states today, okay? I'm going to concentrate on the dynamical Casimir effect and the possibility of laser-like generation of gravitational radiation, which is um, a totally <laughs> way off topic. Uh, that, um, but I do think there is some reality to it, and I'd like to convince you of that. And um, I would like to emphasize this is really a progress report. We don't really have any results yet to uh, re to really uh, present to you, uh, aside from some uh, preliminary uh, lab results on the quality factors of our superconducting cavities. Uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge DARPA, uh, who supported this work for the past two years and is uh, uh, still supporting us through the DSO project uh, that uh, my colleague Jay Sharping at UC Merced uh, has. And uh, let me begin by introducing to you um, my team, our team, of collaborators, postdocs, and students. First of all, uh, uh, Jay Sharping, who's an associate professor now with tenure, <laughs> Uh, at UC Merced, and he's an experimentalist, um, mainly in optical physics, optical fibers, are his specialty. And uh, then uh, some theoretical support, uh, Professor Gerardo Munoz, uh, he's at Fresno, he's an expert on general relativity. Uh, Douglas Singleton, who's an expert on quantum field theory, uh, and my postdoc, who is here, in fact, I'd like him to stand. Could you stand, please? Sure. Uh, that's Dr. Luis Martinez, who did most of the hard work uh, in, in the lab. And then uh, I have a postdoc from South Korea, who got his PhD also with me, Dr. Bong Soo Kang, who's working uh, in our group. Uh, on uh, theory, uh, I have a uh, graduate student Nathan Enon, and we just published a paper together in Fortschritte der Physik uh, uh, on our charge separation effect, which I'll tell you about a little bit later. Al Castelli is uh, working on uh, superconducting RF cavities. Uh, he's about to graduate. Uh, Jake Pate is also doing experiments. And then uh, Jonathan Thompson, who does both theory and experiment. Jonathan, could you please stand up? <clears throat> Jonathan is unusual in that he does both general relativity and experimental physics. <laughs> Should that be required? <laughs> uh, and a uh, very clever uh, senior, Jake Parker, who suggested uh, a conical um, stub cavity, which uh, could be used, I think, for an EM drive, uh, but I won't talk about that uh, today. Uh, okay, so this is an introduction to our group. Um, and I'd like to begin with a motivation for our work. Recently, uh, LIGO has made some spectacular advances of detections of gravitational waves. Uh, LIGO stands for, as you know, Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, and they've been collaborating with a European uh, uh, group in Italy, uh, Virgo, and uh, the idea is due to Ray Weiss, who won the Nobel Prize this year, along with uh, Kip Thorne and, and uh, what's the other one? Oh, well, anyways, uh, they won the Nobel Prize this year for their work on uh, uh, essentially, a Michelson interferometer, 
Uh, here's the central beam splitter, and the two arms uh, go off at, in orthogonal directions. Here's a picture of one of their detectors. I've forgotten whether this is Hanford or Louisiana, but anyways, you can see the two arms that are going off at right angles, and retro-reflecting mirrors, which are, of course, uh, free to move as pendula. And the uh, idea is to use light to detect gravitational waves through the motion of the mirrors. And the interesting thing about this instrument is this is a very early example of what now we call optomechanics. Optomechanics <coughs> is when you couple light to motion, okay? And it turns it, out that LIGO is the granddaddy of all these current optical, optomechanical experiments, of which uh, ours is also an example, uh, as you shall, shall see. Okay, so <coughs> uh, I just begin with a very brief uh, introduction to the detections by LIGO. The very first observation, uh, here's the data uh, from two observatories. You can clearly see the chirp uh, due to the in-spiral of two black holes uh, with black hole masses on the, on the order of, I forgot, 40 uh, solar masses, something like that. Uh, is that right? They were, they were quite large. They were very large. Um, but the most recent observation, uh, uh, in some sense, is the most interesting because it, it was uh, what observation of gravitational waves from a binary neutron star, star in spiral. And they saw... Um, <coughs> Uh, coincident with this detection, gamma rays from the Gamma Ray Observatory and also optical uh, uh, signal. So this also is a... Radio waves. Uh, also radio waves? At what frequency? Actually, there was a gamma ray burst, apparently. No, no, that's the one I said. It's a gamma ray burster, uh, yeah. But the radio is what frequency? Uh, I heard that they had seen radio waves. Oh, well, anyways, it's been seen over the entire uh, electromagnetic spectrum, basically. And uh, so now, uh, uh, with this fourth observation, we're pretty certain that uh, these are real signals. Uh, and so uh, gravitational waves really exist. As, uh, this. Now, the question that I would like to ask is, can gravitational radiation, I call it GR, <laughs> For short, uh, can gravitational radiation be generated, generated in the laboratory? And this goes against uh, the common wisdom in the community, which says the generation of gravitational radiation in the lab seems impossible. <laughs> the, my, my, my colleagues at Berkeley say, are you trying to make a neutron star in your lab? <laughs> <laughs> or black hole? <laughs> Uh, it seems impossible. And this uh, point of view was uh, summarized in uh, Misner, Thorn, and Wheel's book on gravitation, uh, where they state the construction of a laboratory generator of gravitational radiation is a non-attractive enterprise <laughs> uh, in the absence of new engineering or a new idea or both. Shake my fist, I'm generating gravitational waves. It's just, uh, it's just that they're so, so small, small and no. so undetectable that you can't see the energy loss uh, right. and you can't detect them. But it's a practical. Yes. Uh, when you're, yeah, or two fists. Yeah. Uh, like, but, <laughs> <laughs> but the important. Uh, <laughs> that would be pretty extreme. <laughs> uh, and the important adjective here is non attractive. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, when you put in the numbers, as Einstein did first for uh, a very simple uh, um, uh, thought experiment, when you take an I-beam, uh, say made out of steel, and you spin it around and calculate what is the power emitted by uh, such uh, an... Uh, it's, uh, it's so tiny. It's not zero. It's not zero, yeah. but it's so tiny that uh, it seems like it's completely impractical for uh, the foreseeable future. So we need either new engineering or a new idea or both. And I'd like to tell you about our <laughs> new engineering and new idea 
uh, or, or both. <laughs> okay, I'll start with the um, idea. Uh, the idea is that uh, maybe we can use quantum mechanics to advantage to generate gravitational radiation. Why quantum mechanics? Well, uh, it starts off with the idea, which is speculative, that gravity obeys uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, and therefore it should have quantum fluctuations, just like the electromagnetic waves that we're more familiar with. And uh, so uh, this immediately raises the possibility of quantum mechanical sources, sources of gravitational waves. And it all starts with the uncertainty principle, which says that delta E, delta T, is greater or equal to h bar over 2. This is the uncertainty in energy, uncertainty in time, and this applies to any dynamical system, including gravitational dynamical degrees of freedom, uh, and, and in particular, radiation degrees of freedom. So uh, I'm going to hypothesize that vacuum fluctuations, that is zero point energy, uh, applies for any kind of wave, including gravitational waves. Okay? If this is true, and uh, our experiments, if we succeed, will demonstrate this for a fact, then there exists uh, a zero point energy of one half h bar omega, where omega is a wave frequency, and this is independent of the nature of the wave. It includes gravitational radiation as well as the electromagnetic radiation. This is the key hypothesis, okay? Now, uh, notice that this statement is independent of Newton's, the size of Newton's constant, which is tiny, and C, which is huge, and the combination of it, which is C over C, to, uh, sorry, G divided by C to the fourth, comes in as what we call Einstein's coupling constant, which couples the left side of Einstein's equation to the right side, which is the stress-energy tensor. So um, usually, uh, people will throw up their hands in despair when they see the uh, tiny, tiny size of Einstein's coefficient. G over C to the fourth is tiny, tiny, tiny. And so, uh, this is the reason why I, uh, Mr. Thorne and Wheeler threw up their hands in despair. Impossible, for all practical purposes. Uh, but this is maybe a new idea, okay? And this zero point um, energy is independent of Newton's constant and speed of light, but it of course depends on h bar, Planck's constant, which is also very tiny. So, uh, but why should you yes, believe this is a better way? Well, we know the laser exists. And the laser starts off with zero point fluctuations. And it's amplified so that we have a microscopic beam of light that contains on the order of Avogadro's number of photons in a coherent beam. My dream is this can be done with gravitational waves, too, in what I call a graviton laser. Okay, this is my basic thought that I would like to share with you and s see if this is really indeed possible. First, I, it is different from the normal laser in that we do not have any two-level atoms uh, for gravitational waves. So we have to rely on a completely different mechanism, which is a moving mirror, a dy dynamical Casimir effect on the vacuum itself. That is the other key idea. So we don't need any atoms. We don't need any pumping to p invert them. We just need mirrors. But you need mirrors anyway to make a laser. All you need is a moving mirror, and then you're does it have to be a reflector of gravitational waves? Ah, you have. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's the key question. And I'll, uh, uh, how do you make a mirror for gravitational waves? And this was the very first paper I wrote when I retired from Berkeley and went to this new 10th campus. And the paper is called Do Mirrors for Gravitational Mirror, uh, Waves Exist? And uh, we gave the answer yes, <laughs> and I'll show you why, okay? Okay, so the key idea is zero-point fluctuations can be amplified 
uh, by stimulated emission of radiation, uh, just like in a laser, uh, in principle, uh, but starting from uh, seed radiation, which is nothing else than vacuum fluctuations. Uh, and specific mechanism for amplification is what we call parametric amplification of vacuum fluctuations via the dynamical Casimir effect. Uh, and this may be a practical method to uh, generate TR. Now, I should introduce uh, or remind everybody what is the Casimir effect. First, by reminding you that uh, not the dynamical, but the static Casimir effect. Supposing I have two conducting mirrors. Uh, they're represented by two hands. And they're grounded, so no charge, OK? Uh, I, as I bring them closer and closer and closer, I will find that my hands experience a force of attraction between them. And that force of attraction is called the static Casimir effect. And it goes as inverse fourth power of the distance between my hands. Okay, that's the usual static Casimir effect. However, there's another effect which is uh, uh, less familiar, which is called a dynamical Casimir effect. Supposing now I wave one of my hands like this, and I wave it at a frequency which is synchronous uh, with the round trip time of a photon between the mirrors. Then imagine that the photon is like a ping pong ball, and I plaque the ping pong ball in synchronism with its bouncing back and forth a round trip time, so whack, whack, whack. Uh, I will impart more and more energy to the ping pong ball until uh, it becomes a laser. That's the idea behind the dynamical Casimir effect. Moving mirrors uh, can amplify uh, spontane uh, vacuum fluctuations uh, and make uh, stimulated emission of radiation without having any kind of inversion, uh, two-level atom. Has this been demonstrated with light? Uh, depends on whom you talk to. <laughs> 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 there have been experiments uh, uh, in Sweden and in Finland where the mirror is replaced by a Joseph's injunction that uh, behaves like a sort of a mirror, uh, and they've seen the dynamical uh, Casimir effect as a parametric amplification of uh, not light but microwaves in a superconducting. Yeah, obviously, uh, you can't move a mirror at light frequencies. Uh, yeah. No, no, yeah. but but you don't need to move it at uh, light velocity. So this is a key point. We shall see that I don't need to move my hand at <laughs> the speed of light in order to to see the dynamical Casimir effect. It turns out. All I need to do is move it non-relativistically at a velocity which is c divided by the q, the quality factor of the mirror. And q, it turns out, for uh, superconducting cavities is of the order 10 to the 10. That's been demonstrated for uh, accelerators, um, superconducting accelerators. And so if you divide c by 10 to the 10, you get a nice, uh, a really small, reasonable velocity that you can achieve in the lab. So that's the gist of uh, my talk in a nutshell. We can uh, amplify gravitational radiation starting from zero point fluctuations or vacuum fluctuations, just like in the laser, if, big if, we can achieve above threshold. Um, that is where the gain of the laser exceeds the loss through the mirrors. That's, once you do that, you get a beam that comes out automatically, just like in a laser beam. That's our goal. Okay. Is that clear? Any questions? Yes. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, oh, go ahead, Dave. You're closer. <laughs> um, so you're talking about reflecting a, a, uh, a quadrilateral gravitational beam. Um, is there any problem with reflect, uh, is there any problem with reflecting the quadrilateral wave? Uh, the, well, what you mean by quadrilateral wave, I take it, is the, the fact that uh, gravitational radiation, unlike 
electromagnetic radiation is not a vector wave, but a tensor wave yeah. uh, with a fourfold symmetry, for example, in its uh, axes of uh, a distortion, just like in LIGO that I showed you. Okay, uh, well, the, uh, the short answer is no. You, you can also reflect these quadrupolar patterns. Okay, okay with, uh, hopefully, with uh, superconducting mirrors, and that still, ha still has to be demonstrated. Okay, so, so there doesn't appear to be anything so far on the quadrupolar waves that... No. Uh, it, 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 it should obey the optical laws until we come across something that doesn't. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. And, and uh, there was another question over here. John? Oh, yes. Uh, I was just going to say the problem of the gravitational mirror, if you looked at dielectric, the equivalent of a dielectric uh, gravitational mirror as opposed, you know, of course everybody wants a, you know, a metallic, one. Yeah. metallic yeah. Yeah. gravitational uh, mirror like with E&M, uh, but if you have dielectric, uh, you can do yeah, yeah, you can, you uh, E&M uh, waves with dielectrics and the same thing happens, you know, gravity waves don't propagate at the same speed. Well, the problem is the weakness, uh, weakness again, of the gravitational matter interaction is so weak that uh, we have not come up with any uh, poss uh, practical, let's put it, practical uh, suggestion for a dielectric. Okay, but we have come up with one for a, 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 a metallic reflector, namely a superconductor, and uh, for reasons that I will show you, which are again quantum mechanical. Without quantum mechanics, we're dead in the water. <laughs> we need quantum mechanics, yes. I was trying to understand the energy flow, that you're vibrating this mirror and, and energy is coming out in the form of light, uh, or gravity waves or whatever. The, the mirror therefore encounters resistance and it has to work do work again. Exactly. This is the heart of the physics is that uh, the mirror has to do work like a moving piston against these vacuum fluctuations. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, a, a question with two parts. Part one is uh, there is an interpretation of the Casimir effect <coughs> as not being due to the quantum vacuum but uh, is uh, being due to the fine structure constant. There is a, a uh, professor at MIT that yeah. had a paper on this a few years ago, and uh, I, I understand the ideas that uh, uh, originated with uh, Schwinger. What, what is your uh, view on the problem? Yeah, well, there, there is, a, a, as you know, uh, we know him, Peter Maloney, who's written uh, extensively on the question of uh, dual interpretations of the Casimir effect. You can look at it two ways. One is uh, either in terms of uh, vacuum fluctuations of the field, or you can look at currents in the mirrors. For example, uh, my uh, two hands as the conductor, there can be sheets of current that go up and down in synchronism on the two sides, and they, of course, will interact. But they g give the same answer, okay? But, uh with this interpretation where it is not due to the quantum vacuum, now we go to part B, which is, what is your comment on the fact that there is this huge discrepancy on the uh, value of the, uh, what's called, the cosmological constant of the quantum vacuum to a factor of 10 to the, what is it, 120? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, is, that is a rather large number. Do you have any comments on this? Because it goes to the heart of, of the idea that this being due to uh, a, a quantum effect. Yeah, do you mm. believe cosmology or do you believe quantum field theory? Very well said. Uh, do I believe <laughs> cosmology <laughs> do I believe quantum <laughs> field theory? <laughs> I believe in both. Uh, that, are you, are this ans answers that are different by a factor of 10 to the 120th. Ah, uh, it's very interesting. Oh, well, unless you believe in supersymmetry, and then there's the cancellation, of course. Yeah, so supersymmetry seems to have been uh, annihilated, so to speak, by the CERN experiment. Oh, really? I, I, that's news to me. What, what experiment? Well, the light, light as supersymmetric particles have not shown up in the, at the LHC. Uh, LHC. Oh, okay. Uh, I'd have to learn about you. The short answer to you is I don't know. I'm, uh, I just don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. Wait, just one question. Um, LIGO can detect amplitude variations maybe on the order of 10 to the minus 10 meters, right? 
Now, uh, even if you achieve such a laser with an amplification factor of, I'm just guessing, 10 to the 10 would be fantastic, right? The source of gravitational radiation from the quantum vacuum, I'm, I'm just guessing, but maybe it's in the order of 10 to the minus 60 or so. If you can get the 10 order of magnitude advancement, it's still undetectable. Uh, no, that's the whole point of this slide here, is that uh, uh, the, the uh, classical amplitudes you're talking about depend on Einstein's coupling constant and involves Newton's constant g and the speed of light. But when we, whoops, sorry, go back to this basic point, when we look at the uncertainty principle, you'll notice that g and c don't appear on the right side, right? So when you put in the numbers for the zero point fluctuations for the vacuum fluctuations of gravitational radiation, they are just as big as the electromagnetic ones. You don't believe it, I see. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I, I, I recently published a paper where I can show that the Planck's constant actually does depend on C. I, I can send you that. Oh, OK. Well, <laughs> I'm just going by the usual uh, textbook uh, interpretation of the uncertainty principle involves Planck's constant. Uh, uh, and Planck's constant does not, uh, is independent of capital G and capital C. That's the short answer to your question. Okay? If this, this is true, we have some hope. Otherwise, you are right. <laughs> uh, uh, the conventional view is right. You shouldn't even try. <laughs> it's impossible. <laughs> okay? But I don't believe that. I believe that quantum mechanics gives us a new route around the standard objection of Messner, Thorne, and Wheeler. So my point is stimulated emission of gravitons in principle is possible. OK, this is a very brief review, of course, of <laughs> my thesis with John Wheeler <laughs> back in the days when he gave me as my senior thesis topic quantized general relativity. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I did succeed, though, in quantizing the linearized theory. But he wasn't happy. He said, no, that's not enough. <laughs> but the linearized gravitational uh, theory is very similar to uh, electromagnetism. And basically, you can start off with um, a commutator for the uh, creation and annihilation operators, A dagger and A. Uh, and, and then uh, from that, everything else follows. In particular, stimulated emission follows. So when you have a uh, creation operator operating on a Fox state or number state with uh, uh, n sub g graviton number. And when that happens, you get uh, one more uh, graviton, n plus 1. But, uh, but the important thing is a prefactor, square root of n plus 1, can be large when n is already large. And this is the heart of stimulated emission of radiation, as pointed out by Feynman in his uh, uh, undergraduate book. <laughs> um, so this should apply to gravitons as well as to photons. That is my thesis or hypothesis. OK, if this is true, we can build a laser. OK, graviton lasers then can lead us to generation of gravitational waves. If you forget everything else I say, this, remember this slide, OK? <laughs> All right, stimulated emission of graviton should be possible. But um, we don't need, uh, oh, dear, 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 this is not starting off. Uh, let's see, I'll just read it. Uh, uh, dynamical Casimir effect uh, is a way to um, avoid having to use inverted two-level atoms that fill the space between the two mirrors. You just need nothing. You just have the vacuum. And you just wiggle one of the mirrors. And then the following thing happens. See if this, hopefully, this works. Oh, come on. Oops. Oh, it's not working. Oh, Luis. There we go. Ah, <laughs> oh, OK. This is a YouTube simulation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where you wiggle one of the mirrors, and the space between the two mirrors fills up with light. Of course, this is the electromagnetic version 
of the, ty the dynamic Casimir effect. But wh there's no reason why this shouldn't happen also with gravitational waves or gravitons, okay? And so the yellow light could be gravitational waves. If we succeed, this would be revolutionary because we have a source. And this source of gravitational waves, uh, I remind you, can be sent through the Earth because gravitational waves are transparent through the Earth and we can communicate between California and China without the use of a uh, satellite. A receiver on the other end. Yeah, you need a receiver, but the receiver is also uh, an amplifier, yes, you know. You can make a maser the receiver of electromagnetic waves by amplifying them. So that you, the, once you have solved the problem of amplification, you have solved everything, both receiver and, and, and um, sorry, receiver and transmitter. Yeah, transmitter, yes. I have a question about your previous slide. Uh, gravi graviton has a spin of, a, of, two, of two angular momentum units. Where does the spin, where does the angular momentum come from? Oh, um, okay, where does the angular momentum come from? Well, it, you start off uh, with, uh, with the a linearized uh, GR theory and, and all of the angular momentum goes into uh, the modes of the uh, uh, quantized field. So if you look at the theory, these are just the amplitudes that are being quantized. In other words, if you uh, decompose, uh, separate variables and um, put the spin into the mode function, and you look at only the uh, time dependence of the amplitude. Well, the amplitude behaves like a simple harmonic oscillator. We call them radiation oscillators, right? And doesn't depend on the spin. But you have a state here that has no angular momentum, and you have a state over here that has two units of angular momentum. I don't quite see how you get from A to B. I, I would no, no. comment that, you know, if, if the Casimir effect works, I mean, and there's photons that spin one. Yes. Then where do they get their angle? Well, okay, but that's not answering one thing you don't understand with another. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I, no, 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 I will no. say it comes from the same place. Yes, uh, the, 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 the answer is that, that, that zero point fluctuations already have the spin built into them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, the, over there, we have to think of what are we waving? And there is a fundamental difference because. If you look at it from the point of view of general relativity, what uh, you are waving in the gravitational wave is space-time. Yeah. And space-time mm -hmm. is extremely stiff. That's where the, the, the capital G and the C okay. come in. Yes. And it's the stiffness of space-time. <coughs> yes. And uh, which is fundamentally different from what when, when you're saying that it's the same as the photon, because when, with the photon you're not waving space-time. Mm -hmm. And that's why it is, uh, I would say, that uh, this may not work because uh, space-time is extremely stiff. So I think that the derivation is quite right. It's, you know, it's Heisenberg principle and, and, and then you don't have G, but where I think it enters is what are we waving? Uh -huh. yes, you, can, you, you have these disturbances, but what you're trying to wave is so stiff that uh, the strain the strain of space-time is going to be extremely small. So my interpretation is, yes, you're right, that uh, you're, you can have, you can even amplify this, this and stimulate the, these uh, disturbances, but what you're trying to wave is extremely, extremely stiff, and that's where your capital G comes in. Oh, okay. Well, uh, can, can you, uh, we hold off the, to the end where I answer this question by looking at the mirror and seeing how stiff is a mirror for, you see, uh, to make a, a short answer, the superconductor is even stiffer than space-time. That, that's a short answer, and we shall see why. And the answer, uh, well, in short, is that the Coulomb force is 42 orders of magnitudes larger than the gravitational force that comes from G, and the Coulomb force overwhelms this so that effectively the mirror is uh, a hard mirror. It's a, uh, to use the engineering language, the impedance of a superconducting mirror is uh, uh, completely stiff so that 
it reflects gravitational waves, even though uh, space-time is stiff, the superconductor is stiffer, okay? That's the short answer. Yes, the superconductor is stiffer, but I guess I'll cut the weight into the you. Yes, I will come to this. But, but the, the steel, what the wave, which you're trying to weigh. Yes, right? yes. The propagation. <coughs> yes, the very, yes, yes, yes. <coughs> the medium is a it's very, stiff, very stiff. stiff. Yes, exactly. No, that has to be taken into account. Yes. And then, and then you're going to have to then demonstrate that although this is all right, that what you are trying to wave, space-time then, yes. is uh, something that is detectable. Exactly, exactly, yes. This is a key, key point, yes. We'll come back to it, yes. Does the, uh, does the gravitational property of the mirror itself influence anything that you're trying to do between the two mirrors? Is it significant? Is it significant? Uh, when you start moving it back and forth within space-time, does, does the gravitational placement of that oscillating mirror change what would be amplified in between the two? Uh, that's a good question. Um, <coughs> and it's connected with his question about the stiffness of yeah, space kind of is. And also, I guess, would any of the gravitational amplification that's going on between the mirrors affect the materials of the mirrors themselves? Ah, that's another really interesting question. So where they would lose their property or amplify uh, their property? Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I can't answer this and I have to think about it. Okay, okay. And, and let me, th let it percolate in it. And uh, <laughs> I, I will come back. Uh, okay, uh, thank you. Ray. Yes. Um, two things. One, one is on the impedance, uh, usually you separate out the electrical from the mechanical impedance, but we do an electrical measurement at for the whole thing. Yes. Is there gravitational impedance? Yeah, yes. Yes. Yeah, 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 now uh, enters enters the equation. Yes. Exactly. Okay. If, uh -huh. The other thing is is on conservation of angular momentum on the electron. You have not just spin. You have the orbit parameter as well. Right. It would be orbital up at the elect uh, at the atomic level. Uh, at, uh -huh. And so, is there an orbital parameter in the angular momentum? Within the uh, no, the, the, the uh, present uh, realization, the simplest one, uh, has only spin and no orbital. Okay. Argument. But, uh, okay, excellent questions. Okay, uh, let me go. So, uh, this, this is the um, cartoon of the dynamical Casimir effect, which is a moving mirror effect. Uh, and, um, the key piece of physics is that a moving mirror is like a moving piston. And that moving piston can do work. Uh, and it does work, for example, on a photon gas, which compo is co composed starting off with vacuum fluctuations. For example, in this SRF, superconductor radio frequency uh, is SRF cavity, very high Q, and uh, converts them by uh, the, uh, the work uh, com uh, basically amplifies uh, uh, by stimulated emission of radiation. The photons are converted from uh, virtual to real. Okay, so they really uh, fill up. Uh, and uh, the key concept is work. Work is force times displacement of a. Uh, 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 um, Mirror. And with this idea, then one can calculate the gain of the system. So what is the gravitational uh, uh, dynamical classroom effect? All you have to do is replace the yellow dots, which were the photons, by green dots, which represent gravitons. Okay, the same idea. Uh, again, a piston that moves by amount of displacement dx does work. Okay, that's a universal concept. Moving mirrors are pistons that do work. Now this is the actual um, mirror that we are using. We are using uh, silicon wafers that have uh, been doped with nitrogen to form silicon nitride, very thin layer, and you can etch away the silicon uh, so that it leaves only a, a window frame, we call it, that's the outside, and a very thin membrane, a uh, silicon nitride membrane, which is flexible and can move, okay? And this is 
Um, this, uh, if I can, uh, is the next slide? Uh, this is a picture of our silicon nitride uh, membrane sample, and this one has already been uh, coated with supernova niobium, uh, but it still looks green. Yes? Having, ha having worried about how you put niobium on, uh, on copper in order to make a superconducting cavity, uh, how do you, what do you do, sputter the niobium on? Or what? Uh, that's a really excellent question. Uh, we got these uh, from Norcada. It's a Canadian company that yeah. uses sputtering. Uh, we found that uh, these niobium films aren't good enough. Yeah, you cannot electroplate niobium. Mm -hmm. I wish you could. I know, but uh, there is a, and we're now collaborating with uh, Jefferson Labs, and there is a person named Anne-Marie Valente. Uh, she's French. Uh, and she uh, has a new technique using plasma etching uh, techniques to deposit niobium on copper, mm -hmm. and that works. That's okay. actually a technology they're using, they're looking at for um, rocket engine thrust chambers, too. Oh, really? In an additive manufacturing technology, just additively <clears throat> putting it right on top. Who does it uh, for you? Uh, I can check on that, but there's a company I know in Colorado that's exploring some very unique additive manufacturing materials. Um, oh, I would really like to get you in yeah. con contact with this, but uh, Anne-Marie has, uh, I know, uh, made uh, superconductive ni niobium mirrors for uh, confocal Fabry Perot's uh, for a French group, Serge Haroche. He won the Nobel Prize for his work on, uh, <clears throat> well, uh, quantum optics. Um, and uh, they have achieved Qs of 10 to the 11 with at 30, 60 gigahertz in confocal family perros. So this, is, this has been demonstrated. But unfortunately, uh, this sample didn't work. Uh, is that right? OK, so Luis tells me this one didn't work. But here, here uh, is a picture. This is the. Uh, silicon window frame, and in the middle is the green silicon nitride, which has uh, been coated with uh, niobium by sputtering. I think it's on the other side of this, right? Yeah, on the back side, you can't see this, uh, the sputtered film. But, uh, yes? Oh, go ahead, keep finishing, finish and then I'll... Okay, so this is uh, our, what we hope will we'll drive into motion as a moving mirror. So on your prior slide, over there on the left is a cross section, right? So yes. the silicon wafer window frame part is stiffer than the niobium film, right? So at least the way I'm thinking about this is if you're moving this whole thing, the center part is going to be right. like, kind of like a speaker, right? So will the, I'm sure the, it seems like the angle of incidence of whatever's trapped between the mirror and the other side because you're going to get this deformation of the green part yes. is going to be more, it's not going to be flat. Ah, yes. This right, is as a, you start uh, to yes, yes, that's, this is an so excellent it's point. Going to also, it's going to kind of act as a focusing and then a diffusing and then a focusing and a diffusing. Yeah, and that, uh, 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 and that's an excellent point. Uh, that, uh, there will be distortions of yeah. this. Uh, Just but from the mechanical. Uh, yeah, but uh, we'll come uh, to the point that uh, radiation pressure, which acts on this membrane at, uh, in our case, 10 gigahertz, is doubled in frequency to 20 gigahertz. So the driving force here is at microwave frequencies. Okay. It's so high above any acoustical resonance that we can think of the membrane as essentially a free mass. Hmm. Okay. And so the free mass motions will follow the uh, mode pattern of the um, whatever mode that you use, and we're using a TE011 mode. Is that right, uh, Luis? Is, uh, TE011, right? Which has bulges here and there, uh, but it's uh, these are. Ten Along a similar line, would you expect any thermal distortion of the mirror? Uh, that's uh, again. Well, uh, the thermal distortions again uh, are at very low frequencies. We're talking about microwave frequency effects. So, uh, although they may, they may well be there, uh, we don't uh, we don't see them because we're uh, monitoring microwave motions. Okay. Thank okay. You. So here's our sample. 
Oh, and now we see, uh, this is um, a paper that, uh, in which Luis is the lead author that just got published in the New Journal of Physics. Uh, we did a simple experiment at room temperature just to see, uh, get our feet wet, in which we incorporated the silicon nitride membrane. And here it is, you see the green uh, silicon nitride in the middle, the uh, gray silicon uh, window frame outside, uh, but in a simple copper uh, 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 cavity, uh, cylindrical cavity, excited in the TE011 mode, okay? And we wanted to just uh, not uh, see the free motion, but just acoustical uh, response. And uh, here is the main uh, drum uh, 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 mode at roughly uh, six kilohertz. And here uh, is the response as a function of microwave power. Of course, it goes up uh, with power. Uh, but we monitored this motion by using a Michelson interferometer. And we saw, uh, uh, here are the results. And this um, shows that we can move the mirror. But of course, this is at uh, very low frequencies. But it's a step in, the, in that uh, main direction. What would you explain is the, the, the shifting of the peak to the right as you go up in power level? Oh, boy. <laughs> Luis, I need to It's not to much. I mean, it's a couple. Yes. Couple yeah, Luis, can you address the question of uh, Greg? We haven't confirmed this, but we thought it was too nasty. Uh, we were pretty low action, we were working at the other part. So uh, we thought we did some experiments where we changed the actual pressure on the chip, and we were able to see that even more. So okay. we thought it was damping through the motion of the membrane. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, seeing a dynamical Casimir effect. This is a two-cavity uh, example, although we are also thinking of using three-cavity, but um, we have a left cavity, which is a pump cavity, and in the middle is this red uh, uh, vibrating membrane, and that's, remember, it behaves like a piston, and it does work on the vacuum, nothing. <laughs> and uh, and uh, above a certain threshold, which is achievable, as sh I shall show you, if, uh, if big if, uh, the mirrors are very high quality. If so, then uh, the signal and the idler will build up together, mutually reinforcing each other, and build up as this yellow light that is going to fill up the right cavity, and you can pick that up as RF uh, uh, in electromagnetic waves, or hopefully, uh, GR, uh, gravitational radiation, uh, in the um, uh, gravitational uh, sector, hopefully. So, uh, Ray, on, on your parametric amplification, you're only using the first harmonic and uh, not any higher harmonics? Uh, uh, no, it, it's the second harmonic. In other words, uh, if the pump is at uh, frequency F, right. the motion of the membrane is at 2F. Because okay. of right, the right. okay standard standard parametric yeah exactly uh, but, but you, you uh, don't see anything at 4f or higher uh, well actually we haven't done any experiments uh, on that so I don't know I uh, but I suspect they're very small and the other thing is you you're not controlling 2f that is you're only using single in, input frequency yes. and letting yes. naturally generate. naturally so yes. you don't you don't have tight control of your parametric amplification uh, yes but we do have control over the amplitude of the pump and the, the key is to see if there's a abrupt threshold a laser like threshold above which suddenly you start seeing radiation on the right side that is the key okay a threshold okay all right, and the rest are really important technical details I'm going to skip, which is how to tune uh, these uh, cavities and, we, uh, and how to uh, avoid losing high-quality factors when you have gaps here and so on. Is cavity superconducting too? Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's very important. And uh, so, the, so when you say, pardon me, when you say superconducting, what temperature are we talking about? Are we talking all the way down at the helium level? or Oh, below. We have um, uh, dilution refrigerators that go down uh, to uh, the order of 10 millikelvin. Mm -hmm. Okay? 
and uh, so you're well, down on the bottom. Yes, and uh, yes, exactly. And uh, there are some new physics in that uh, we have measured the Q of these really high uh, uh, SRF cavities at these very low temperatures. Okay, well that's uh, not published work. Yes. Uh, any questions from the back of the room? Uh, Luis, do you have any comments? Okay, so far? Okay, so good. Okay, so... Um, so what is the Q? Uh, the, <laughs> excellent question. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, well, uh, do you want to address that, uh, Luis, for answer, Don? Oh, all right, okay. <laughs> Okay, this is a simple uh, uh, example of a parametric amplifier that you all know. As uh, kids, you can pump a swing uh, if you stand and squat, stand and squat, in synchronism with the motion of the swing, but if you analyze this, you see you're standing and squatting in the second harmonic of the swing motion, okay? So this is exactly what we're doing. The center of mass is being pumped as a second harmonic, okay? so. This is exactly the, um, wh what we're doing in the, uh, a pump, moving the membrane at the, s at the second harmonic. The pump is at 10 gigahertz. This is what we're using. The motion of the membrane is at 20 gigahertz, okay? And the signal idler is generated at 10 gigahertz, a subharmonic, okay? So that's uh, what we're doing for the electromagnetic case. And, um, uh, we still haven't achieved even a uh, threshold yet for this electromagnetic. But once we do, we believe, <laughs> this is big, that maybe we'll see also gravitational radiation, but um, we'll see, okay. Yes? Can you take, and, and assuming this works, is this evidence for the existence of the quantum vacuum? Oh, wow. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> you always uh, ask such hard questions. <laughs> uh, again, this goes back to the ambiguity which Peter Maloney um, you know, pointed out. Uh, you can interpret uh, this in two ways. One is uh, uh, the Casimir effect is really a quantum vacuum effect. Yeah. But the other way is forget about a vacuum, it's all the currents. currents. Yeah. And you can interpret it even if you generate a signal there, you can interpret it as currents rather than the quantum vacuum. I, I think that Peter Maloney would say that. Okay. Is that uh, what you, you're right? Mm -hmm. And I just like pairwise Van der Waals. Yes, exactly. Well, it's yeah. uh, a retarded Van der Waals uh, forces, okay? And uh, so this is the electromagnetic experiment. And the electromagnetic experiment can be uh, calculated uh, in detail using motional EMF, electromagnetic motor force, whereby if you have a moving conductor, the, uh, uh, and it, there's a magnetic field into which uh, it runs into this magnetic field, they're represented by these blue crosses, then there is generated a electric field which is given by the cross product of the velocity of the membrane crossed into the B field. Okay, this is uh, how a motor works. Generator. Generator or motor. Uh, and this is exactly the same thing we're doing uh, except at microwave frequencies. The interesting thing that I want to emphasize is, uh, is that when you have time variations, because of this cross product, you can generate some and difference frequencies. It's a nonlinear effect where if you put, for example, one frequency here for the velocity and another frequency here for the magnetic field, you generate a, yet a sum or difference frequency for the electric field. And this is the heart of the parametric amplifier, okay? And so this leads to parametric amplification. I won't I'll skip all the details about the calculation, but it's the same one as uh, in the electromagnetic case as in the gravitational wave case. And um, it leads to a threshold. And now uh, this is the key result. This is published in the Festschrift uh, for uh, uh, Yakir Harnoff's 80th birthday. Uh, this is um, where I first suggested that uh, we could make graviton lasers. 
And here's the threshold for the, such a device. M is the mass of the membrane, supposing it's three milligrams. And then the product of three frequencies, the pump, signal, and idler frequencies, which will assume to be degenerate and uh, it's 10 gigahertz. And uh, the length of the cavity squared comes in. Uh, and uh, this factor of four can be debated. <laughs> but anyways, there's, uh, the important thing is the product of Qs. You notice that if Q is high, it comes in essentially as the third power when you multiply together the pump, <laughs> signal, and eyelid cavity. So it's extremely important to get high Qs, okay? And so uh, if you have a Q of 10 to the 9, you put them into these numbers, it's uh, about a tenth of a milliwatt, which is easily achievable. And also importantly, it's under <laughs> the cooling power of a dilution refrigerator so that we don't overheat the system, okay? So it's achievable. But the big question is, will we generate both electromagnetic waves and gravitational waves? Um, and uh, here, Jay Sharping made a really important remark. He says, no, they, they will be slightly shifted from each other in frequencies. And so you can discriminate by tuning between the electromagnetic and the gravitational wave sectors. Can you remind us again uh, about the subscripts uh, P, I, and S? Okay, P is pump, I is idler, S is signal, okay? For, uh, this is borrowing the electrical engineering notation for parametric amplifiers, okay? So the, the Q of the signal is, arri is uh, arising from what? Oh, uh, again, let's go back uh, one slide. This is uh, the cavity. It it's come, uh, arises from, if you like, the skin resistance okay. uh, of the cavity. Okay? So this is a, uh, a Faraday law, essentially, is, is at the heart of parametric amplification. Yes? Does that formula suggest you could use really terrible cues if you just went to lower frequencies. There's omega cubed essentially on the top and Q cubed on the bottom. Oh, oh, okay. Let me uh, see. Uh, that's a... Oops, well, the wrong way. Yeah, uh, yeah. In principle, you're right. The frequencies, uh, if we went to lower frequencies, uh, would make it even easier. Yes, in principle, yes, but uh, and but the, would get bigger too. It, it's hard to make uh, large cavities for lower frequencies. So uh, we, we the problem is that if you make the frequencies lower, then the size of the cavity goes, goes up. And, yeah, and, that's and that's it's a practical of, it's a practical that cancels problem. two of the three factors. Yeah. What would be some of your loss mechanisms here, where you need to put some sort of efficiency term in here for or terms to? You know, for any kind of thermal losses or uh, deformations or distortions or anything of that nature? Have those been thought about? Uh, yes. Well, the Q factors here are what we call loaded Q, okay? And um, so uh, you can put in all the losses in okay. there. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay, this is an actual measurement. Well, unfortunately, not of a cylindrical cavity in the TE011 mode. This is for uh, a SRF stub cavity. That is a uh, basically a coax uh, with uh, a shorting plane at the end and a stub at the other end, a uh, quarter wave way. Okay, this stub cavity has been extensively used by the Yale group, um, uh, Sholkov, to do. Uh, uh, quantum optics uh, at microwave frequencies, and we have re duplicate, uh, we duplicated one of their uh, d designs in our own lab. Uh, machinist uh, made a Q, and the uh, really striking thing is we achieved a Q of around two times ten to the nine, two billion, using our uh, uh, <coughs> dilution refrigerator operating a 55 millikelvin. And the beta for the coupler, uh, I didn't go into the technical details. Is um, is this uh, undercoupled or overcoupled, Luis? Over? What? Over. 
overcoupled. Okay, it's overcoupled. And the interesting thing here is the time constant is uh, on the order of 10 milliseconds, really long. And so um, uh, here's the uh, resonance frequency of the stub cavity. Uh, and if we had um, this result for our cylindrical cavity, we'd be jumping up and down for joy because then we could do the param. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, this is not the right cavity. But now I come to the crucial question, which is why are superconductors mirrors for gravitational waves? And here is a reason in short. It's something called a charge separation effect, and this has been cut off for some reason. Uh, in our first paper on this, we called this the Heisenberg Coulomb effect. Heisenberg hyphen Coulomb. Why? Because uh, two things are going on. There's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle because Cooper pairs are um, yeah, Bose-Einstein condensed into the ground state, which is a zero momentum state. If you know the momentum is zero, exactly, then you don't know uh, where the Cooper pairs are at all. It's infinitely uncertain. So there's delocalization of the Cooper pairs, which is fundamental uh, from quantum mechanics. That's why Heisenberg. Why Coulomb? Well, the ionic lattice, on the, by contrast to the Cooper pairs, are uh, localizable classical almost particles. They are stuck in their lattice sites. And uh, at the high frequencies of microwaves, they will follow geodesics, okay? They will undergo free fall in the gravitational field. So, for example, if you have a cross-polarized gravitational wave indicated in blue here, the tidal forces uh, yank the ionic lattice along diagonals, so the, uh, there will like, be an extrusion of positive charges indicated in orange here, of positives uh, in these two corners, but by charge conservation, there has to be negative charges in the opposite two corners. Therefore, you get a charge separation effect when a gravitational wave hits the superconductor. Now, why is that important? The reason is because the Coulomb force is 42 orders of magnitude stronger than the gravitational force. So what happens is there is a Coulomb attraction between the positives and the negatives which completely overwhelms the gravitational force that is trying to pull them apart. Or put it in other words, there's a Hooke's law that is due to the Coulomb force, which is so strong that the back action of the superconductor on the incident gravitational wave will reflect it. Okay, that's the story. Okay, to put it in engineering terms, the uh, Coulomb force leads to an impedance for this device, which is even lower than the extremely low impedance of free space for uh, gravi gravitational radiation. So if you have, um, uh, you know, it's an impedance problem. If it's an impedance mismatch, you'll get reflection, okay? This is the heart of the physics. If this is true, then we have mirrors. If you have mirrors, you can have moving mirrors. If you have moving mirrors, they can do work as pistons. Then if you can do work, then you can amplify. Then we can produce gravitational, graviton lasers are a possibility. Okay, but, yes. But, but again, at that point, you are generating the gravitational wave, but the wave is going to wave a medium that is extremely stiff. So it is, as for example, let's say that you, like you were talking about the speaker, right? You have a speaker uh, that is a sound speaker. The, 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 the stiffness of the, uh, the air is uh, such that uh, you, you can stimulate the speaker and then you, you, you can transmit the wave through the air that had to do with this, the, 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 the polar compressibility of the air. If, if I would have a medium 
that it would be very stiff, like for example, people used to think about the ether, right? Then uh, the stiffness of that medium is extremely high, and therefore, then you have something like light. The problem is that space-time is, is extremely, extremely stiff. So at this point, yes, you are generating the gravitational wave, but is this gravitational wave going to be able to transmit itself through space-time in order to be detectable? Uh -huh. So how do you, where is the detection going? Oh, yeah, well, the, 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 the yeah. okay, that's the, the, yes, that's an extremely important question. First of all, though, uh, let's uh, try to break this into two parts. First, can we generate? Okay, if we can generate, then let's go on to consider how do we detect, okay? okay? We'll break it up into two parts. Now, to answer your point, first of all, this mirror uh, effectively is stiffer than even space. So if it moves, it <coughs> ether moves. <laughs> Okay, that, roughly. It's a very crude analogy with acoustics, but uh, it's essentially an impedance problem. And the uh, bottom line is a superconductor is essentially hard wall boundary conditions for gravitational waves. This is our thesis. Due to the fact that the Coulomb force is 42 orders of magnitude stronger than the gravitational force. That is the bottom line. Okay, and we call this effect the Heisenberg-Coulomb effect, or sometimes we call it the charge separation effect because when a gravity wave hits this square, it separates charges, which is very unusual for a gravitational interaction, yes. On that charge separation, a question about why the Cooper pairs would stay in their original configuration or go out to the top left and bottom right. Why would Cooper pairs just stay with the ionic lattice and stretch in the uh, bottom left, top right uh, extension? Oh, because uh, they are in a quantum ground state. And the ground state is a zero momentum ground state. And uh, the quantum adiabatic theorem says, uh, no, it won't respond uh, to follow the ionic lattice because of, if you like, uh, quantum uh, adiabatic theorem, uh, to be technical, okay? Or put it differently, there is a gap between the ground state and the first possible excited state, which is given by the BCS gap, <coughs> bardeen cooper schrieffer gap. And we are working way below the gap so that we n n it is um, adiabatically stiff. Uh, that's a one way to say it, okay. So the gravitational wave, if, you were to t if, they, if this was to be generating, it would kind of come in and out of the page along that hole. No, it would uh, be going up and down along these blue lines. Oh, I see. Okay. It's it's not uh, in and out, but it is. Uh, it's cycling like, like uh, it's stretching and squeezing uh, okay. uh, along these uh, blue. Uh, okay. Contours. All right. I'm just trying to picture what you know. Is this does this square represent just a like a mirror in general? Uh, this is just a, a, a piece of superconductor that we place uh, with its center of mass uh, coinciding with the tidal pattern of the gravitational waves indicated okay. in blue, okay? okay? It's a state of pure shear. So in yeah. state of pure shear, you can visualize it as being due, to, like you said, due to a force that is stretching in, in the 45 degree direction and compressing on the other one, or you can look at it just as a state of pure shear, like you showing there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, a shear wave, mm -hmm. okay? Okay. Yes? You, get, and you started this off on a premise of equating the strengths that you can get with parametric amplification of gravity waves versus electromagnetic waves. And I wonder if that allows you to have some, you know, waypoint check looking for electromagnetic amplification coming out of this to tell you you're on the right track as you go. Absolutely. This is uh, exactly our, our procedure. We are going to do first, of course, the easy uh, stuff is look for the electromagnetic parametric amplification. And even that, yes, that has never been seen before. No one has generated the amplifier effect for electromagnetic. Right. With, a, with a real moving boundary, they've only done it with uh, effective 
Well, uh, let me be precise. The Swedes and the Finns have demonstrated uh, using a Joseph's injunction as an effective moving mirror by uh, modulating the supercurrents through a Joseph's injunction. But that's not the same thing as actual mo motion of a moving mirror. Okay? We're going to do a real moving mirror experiment. You, you traded a squid to move a path length very quickly for a high cube to not have to move very quickly? Yes, yes, exactly. That's, you've caught, caught the point, yes. And uh, the numbers work out so that if your Q is on the order of a billion or higher, we can do it, okay? So, um, now I, I want to address the um, general relatives in the audience. Why should we expect this on the basis of Einstein's field equations? Well, uh, the stress tensor on the right side of Einstein's equations is a uh, second rank tensor, okay? And it can be thought of as a tensor product of two vectors. And the only two vectors in the problem here are the velocity vectors v mu, v nu uh, uh, of the supercurrents. And so, now, but we know from uh, well, the electrodynamics of this, uh, London solved this problem years ago, that the supercurrents decay uh, on a scale of the London penetration depth into the superconductor. Okay, so we know V goes as E to the minus Z over London penetration depth. If you have a product of two of these vectors, Vx and Vy both going as these exponentials, the product will go as twice these, this, and that implies that the stress energy tensor will decay on half the London penetration depth, which is quite amazing. It means that the Meissner effect for gravity is even stronger than that of electromagnetism, in the sense that the penetration is even, it's half the uh, London penetration depth. For, the Meissner, gravitational Meissner effect. And it turns out Einstein linearized is going to give you small um, h, which is the metric deviations from flat space time. hxy will go as uh, txy, and that will go as, uh, again, z over lambda la, London divided by 2. Okay? So, we're going to, if we are successful, we'll so solve many, many problems all at once. <laughs> and this will... Uh, Does that mean that uh, superconductors expel gravitational lines of force? Yes. That sounds like Cabarite, uh, H.G. Wells. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it, sounds, it really sounds like uh, science fiction. It does. <laughs> I'm trying to look at as well as... You know, I'm kind of going back to what he just said about didn't put a flat off, try to save it, you know, superconductors emanate gravity and shield. <laughs> Yeah, in fact, I have to tell you a joke. Uh, I was invited to speak uh, at the physics department colloquium at University of Washington, Seattle, and in the audience was Jim Bardeen, you know, the son of uh, famous John Bardeen, who does general relativity. And after my talk, he came up to me and looked at me very quizzically, and he said, you, you are proposing anti-gravity, aren't you? <laughs> well, uh, no, I have to say that this is not DC uh, uh, ex gravitational fields. We're, we're talking about radiation at 10 gigahertz being expelled, okay? <coughs> Uh, okay. Just, just, just one comment. I mean, there have been several papers on the gravitational, um, on, on the penetration depth of uh, uh, gravitational waves, let's say, in superconductors. And, uh, for example, a neutron star, it has been predicted that the penetration depth is 12 kilometers. So um, it's, it's, it's not <coughs> on the order of magnitude that the electromagnetic Yes. Depth. So yeah. It's much, much, much larger. So it's not. Yes, exactly. Yeah, this is a very good point. Uh, the difference is, um, in a neutron star, you have a neutral superfluid. In a superconductor, you have a charged superfluid. Mm. And the charge makes a huge difference because the Coulomb force comes into play, and the Coulomb force completely overwhelms the gravitational field uh, forces by 42 orders of magnitude. 
so that the uh, London penetration depth for neutron stars, admittedly, uh, very <laughs> is ir irrelevant for superconductors. That's my point. Yes. I was going to say that if you have a superconductor, you can't allow electric field in it. So therefore, are you saying that since gravity, because the charges have different masses, will try to create an electric field in a superconductor that will try, and you're saying the superconductor, since it won't allow an electric field, won't allow that, that this is somehow negating gravity? Uh, it is in a sense that uh, what, what I'm saying is that the charge separation effect, or the Heisenberg-Coulomb effect, um, uh, leads to a uh, huge back action, effectively a Hooke's law. Oh, okay. Okay, that is so strong that it back acts onto, it, it, uh, it just uh, presents a hard wall boundary condition to the gravitational wave. That's the bottom line. You can test this experimentally right now with LIGO. So you put a superconductor, superconducting shield in front of one of the detectors, right? And then it shouldn't uh, detect anything because the gravitational wave is reflected, right? I don't think LIGO would like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, first of all, uh, in principle, yes, you, what you say is true, but. Uh, in practice, it's very hard to uh, encase the uh, LIGO mirror in the superconductor uh, that allows the... Uh, oh, well, you have well, to this is frequency power. dependent. LIGO is looking at very low frequency. Oh, that's true. Yeah, that's another very good point. Yeah. Yes. This is almost like you're saying a superconductor is a gravitational inductor. It's opposing high frequency penetration. Yes, uh, uh, I would put it in slightly different language. I could call this a gravitational Meissner effect, in which the uh, gravitational f radiation fields are expelled from the superconductor on a scale of length of half the London penetration depth. Okay? So it's an expulsion effect. So in a sense, Jim Bardeen is right. I, 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 I'm talking about anti-gravity, but anti-gravity at uh, 10 gigahertz. Yeah. Not at DC. No. OK. So in, uh, I'll draw the general analogy. Um, we have uh, laser scissors. We use lasers for cooling, essentially. and so. So one would expect that those type of applications to occur with a gravitational laser. Ah, uh, uh, good question. I haven't thought of all those applications which could so, possibly. So, because the question I think, I think with a gravitational laser would be, can you not only can you push and pull? Uh -huh, okay. Uh -huh. so can you deflect? Can you have a particle deflector on a light ship? Or can you can you uh, can you have a tractor beam? Are those practical app? Are these far field applications of what you're doing? Mm. And how far out of the device will it work? You're talking about radiation pressure for gravitational waves, right? You know? Yeah. Yes. Oh well. It's the same as light, which really is small. Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, John is right. Uh, all the usual things for light will work also for gravitational waves in principle like radiation pressure, but it's small because, uh, yes, you know, uh, uh, well, anyways. Uh, yeah, I mean, gravitational, is a, it's a distortion of space-time that's moving instead of something kind of yeah, riding through. Still, it's, 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 it's still, the, the basic point is the pressure, the radiation pressure is the same as for light. It's, uh, it's a power divided by C, uh, something like that, and it's not, it's, it's not big. Unfortunately. The speed of light is a large problem. Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah. Any further questions? Okay. Well, uh, I'm almost done. No rush. No rush. Uh, no rush. Okay. <laughs> so, anyway, the charge separation effect leads to huge superconducting plasma frequency. Uh, here's the final result uh, the plasma frequency for uh, gravitational 
uh, um, plasma effect is uh, around the same order as for the electromagnetic one. It's 10 to 16 uh, hertz, roughly. And therefore, microwave frequency gravitational waves will undergo a plasma-like reflection, if you want to think of it in those terms, from the superconducting surface. And therefore, a superconductor is a mirror for uh, gravitational waves. Um, well, okay, I, I'm, I actually, um, on my last slide, I'll just re-summarize all the conclusions that come out of this talk. First uh, and foremost, uh, I believe that uh, superconductors are mirrors for gravitational, uh, microfrequency uh, free, uh, gravitational wa waves or radiation. Uh, moving uh, superconducting coated membranes like silicon nitride membranes act like moving mirrors or pistons that can do work, that's a key concept, work, on vacuum fluctuations. Converting them from virtual to real uh, 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 folk gravitons. Uh, electromagnetic and gravitational vacuum fluctuations can be amplified to become detectable electromagnetic and gravitational waves through the dynamical Casimir effect, okay? This moving mirror effect. And you can think of this as a parametric oscillation or uh, amplifier that can be achieved in high Q superconducting cavities with Qs on the order of a billion and pump powers on the order of milliwatts. It's doable, okay? And then uh, final conclusion, thus laser-like generation of microwave frequency gravitational radiation should be possible in the lab. Yes, so I'm done. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, John. So, question on the detection scheme. So step one would be to look at any EM radiation that comes out and make sure it's working as expected and it's either quantum vacuum or any currents or whatever you have. What would be the detection scheme for looking at actual gravitational radiation? How do you see you've measured that? Ah, oh, excellent question. I've only talked about generation, but uh, <clears throat> Uh, I studied with Charles Towns, who was the inventor of the one of them, of the laser, and he pointed out that once you have an amplifier, you can also make a detector from the amplifier. Mm -hmm. And one of his graduate students, <laughs> Arno Penzias, used the maser, which is the granddaddy of the laser, to make the first detection of the cosmic microwave background, okay? So it, once you have an amplifier, you can make a detector, okay, in principle, okay. Now in practice, well, how do you do it? Well, you have to uh, do um, a kind of Hertz-like experiment where you have two cavities, one which is an amplifier, but then the other one uh, is, um, uh, acts like, well, okay, uh, here's uh, a practical scheme. Once you have generated lots of gravitational waves and it enters into a high Q superconducting cavity with an empty pump cavity, it will produce uh, a, a motion on the uh, membrane and convert into electromagnetic waves that can then be detected. Okay, so that's one way. But there are many ways to do it. Once you have lots of power, you can rectify and so on, hopefully, the electromagnetic aspects, which are, you have to do a conversion though. And then just to check my understanding of that, um, you would have to have some kind of shield for EM radiation, you have to have some kind of Faraday cage around your detector to make sure. Oh yes, yes, I forgot to mention that. Yeah, and and, uh, and uh, fortunately for us, there's a very simple one. If, if you make a copper Faraday cage, copper is not a superconductor, even down to millikelvin temperatures, and so it is the way to discriminate between uh, gravitational waves and uh, the gravitational waves, however, will penetrate through the copper, and that's how you uh, discriminate between the two. Yes, John. A couple of comments. One of them is that there was a guy named Robert Baker yeah. who was bombarding me with email and, and so forth about 10 years ago about high frequency gravitational waves by being a, generating and detecting a do you know anything at all about his work and whether, uh, it's relevant, uh, whether it makes any sense? Or not? Yeah, I know. Uh, I've I've heard of Baker and I, uh, 
lives down here in Playa del Rey, actually. Oh, I have never met him, however, and uh, I, I don't know uh, the specifics of his scheme uh, enough to comment. I, I, I saw a report from somebody, maybe it was the Federation of American Scientists, who had had a panel looking into his work and decided there wasn't much in it. But I, I oh, that. okay. There's a case in numerous trips to China to talk, yeah. talk with them about their work, yeah. work in the same type of field, yeah. high frequency gravitation. He has a book out. Oh, uh, I see. Last year after the other point is, if you're going to try to detect uh, these kinds of high frequency gravitational waves, seems to me you can make a parabolic superconducting mirror. <laughs> oh, yes, exactly. Actually, there's a really important experiment uh, waiting in the wings once we have made an amplifier. Uh, again, it's Pe Arno Penzias all over again. We look for the cosmic microwave background and gravitational radiation and microwave frequencies. It should be there. Is there estimates of how much is produced in the Big Bang? Ah, uh, yes, and and, uh, and there and it's all over the map because um, uh, there is a uh, scientific American article many years ago by a very famous uh, st string theorist, uh, Veneziano. And it's, uh, I think it's called The Myth of the Big Bang. He doesn't believe in the Big Bang. But basically, uh, he, he predicts that there should be lots of microwave background, but um, uh, as I recall, though, uh, his predictions uh, fall under the usual uh, thermodynamic cosmic uh, predictions, if it were, uh, in thermal equilibrium at uh, 2.7 Kelvin with the uh, standard cosmic microwave background. But there are other theories which, uh, uh, there's one by Steinhardt, Paul Steinhardt, yes. that uh, is much less than Veneziano's. Uh, you, uh, the answer, short answer is it's all over the map. So uh, if we make an observation, we can settle uh, these cosmological questions. Well, one final comment is that this, since it's a propulsion workshop, <clears throat> we can think of shooting gra uh, laser-like gravitational waves out the back and propelling your spaceship. But the problem is it's okay. the same as, li as yes, light. light right. It gives you 3.3 micronewtons per kilowatt, and uh, that's not very interesting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, I'm here to learn, and uh, I'm interested in Jim Woodward's idea that you can use a dynamical Casimir effect for a thruster. It's a totally new idea. I need to learn about it. Can somebody tell me in a word what it is, this idea? You might be doing it already. Yeah, you might be doing it already and not knowing it. Oh, really? <laughs> well, can you explain? Uh, vibrating PZT crystals, <laughs> or PZT stack, mm -hmm. kind of like your vibrating mirror. Oh. But I don't think it's the right frequency. Oh, oh, but okay. But, 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 uh, no, no, but uh, I, uh, my question is this. How is a dynamical Casimir effect related to a thruster? In all, in all these thrusters that are uh, high Q thrusters, we'll call it, okay, the common element appears to be nonlinearities with regards to in, in, in stated condition is sort of parametric amplification. Oh. It may not be obvious to some of the researchers that are doing it, whether they're professional or amateur, but, but that's the very first place you start. You oh. measure all the nonlinearities. Oh, I but see. Parametric amplification. Well, that's exactly what I'm talking about here, right? Precisely. And in, in, but instead of doing it for radio, we're doing it for propulsion. That's that's pretty much. It. Oh, that's the only difference. Yeah. Oh. Well, one of the things that I'm still struggling with, I guess, even as far as a beam of this stuff, is how the beam does not diffuse or disperse as soon as it leaves its, its chamber? And how does it not go in oh, all directions? Oh, it, it, it will, it will. Okay, uh, so what's, so I guess then it brings back to, you know, can you really use it as a propulsion device? You could make a mirror, a par parabolic mirror that would refocus it. So. Still, but then once it refocuses, how well, far out does it, it go before parallel, it just... Well, make what, it a parallel beam. What's the dispersion factor? It's a dispersion thing. You yeah, know, it's not, a, it's not yeah, the same as an EM wave. Could you build an array of these? Most, la most diode lasers really do that, but they put a lens inside to make them go straight. But that's a light wave. That's yeah, not a gravitational but, wave. But here we have a way of making a lens with a parabolic superconducting mirror. Yeah, I'm just thinking the 
the, the medium is, you're working on the medium, not something that's moving through the medium, which is very different, right? It's like trying to get a wave that's, you know, on well, the surface uh, of a pond that's going well, in one direction. Let me, let me make a, a fundamental... Like if that was of interest, I don't know why it would be, but... Yeah, but it's, you know, like, to, you know, force, <laughs> a, a, a directed force. If you just do a, uh, a chamber, like, just straight electromagnetic propulsion, <laughs> where you're firing a laser out of a yeah, spacecraft yeah, 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 yeah. to... <laughs> Of course, the laser is going to diffuse eventually too, but you still get your how many um, yeah. mic nanonewtons per uh, kilowatt? 3.3 3 nano, nano newton, or micronewtons per kilowatt. Yeah, so um, you know you still get that. What happens to the laser beam after it's far away from the spaceship is not right. important. Yeah. It's, uh, it's uh, yeah, the but, but the Even as soon as it leaves and hits the non creating medium, it's going to disperse. Well, no, it's, it's like, going to diffract. It's going to diffract just like any wave. And the yeah. diffraction is fundamental. You can't get rid of it. It's, right. uh, but it doesn't uh, disperse for a while because we got this. Yeah. <laughs> you, and, but the, uh, it's optics all over again. If you, As uh, John say, says, if you have a parabolic mirror, you can refocus it so that uh, it's all, uh, it's just, uh, it's optics all over again. You can actually again. trace it back to the radiation pressure on the interior walls of the cavity. Mm -hmm. That's where the force is actually right being applied, you know, just like in a rocket thrust chamber. And, and of course, in a rocket thrust chamber, you know, you make it nice and nozzle you want, but the thrust will... Yeah. Well, as soon as it hits zero pressure, it goes in all directions. Right. Yeah, right. There's some I think, momentum. I think Mike had a question. Oh, oh yes. yes. I was just curious to hear someone from ID or Jim's group to comment on that relation between yeah, dynamic have, Casimir effect. I don't, think, effect I don't think we've ever mentioned that the dynamic Casimir effect has anything to do with the <coughs> negative drive. I certainly haven't said or, that. Or, or, or parametric numbers are good. Yeah, uh, Jim hasn't said that either. I think maybe Jordan McClay was talking about uh, dynamic Casimir effects. Very, very small yeah, microsystems. Um, I'm not very familiar with his work. Right. But somebody at this conference, I'm sure, said this point that the dynamical Casimir effect. Uh, uh, it was it me? It wasn't you. Okay. Who was it? I, I, I'm sure I heard it in one of the slides. Yeah. 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 Oh, it's, uh, it was Highland. He was yeah. Highland. Yeah. He's not here anymore, right? Yeah, he's, he, he left before. Oh, uh, okay. No, I don't think he said that, though. Oh, he didn't say that? No, oh, okay. Maybe I misheard him. Uh, he did maybe say... Maybe a question. Oh, oh, okay. He was okay. asking the question, but I don't think he Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. So, uh, so I'm back to the, to the first question I asked. Okay, I, I can follow your uh, train of thought. Yes, that the capital G does not appear in the uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle. I can also follow and, and I agree that, that this behaves as a mirror. I can follow and I agree that yes, you may be, this may try to generate gravitational waves, but we're back, like you said, separate this into the generation and the detection. And I'm back to the part two, which is the detection. You're trying, this is trying to generate gravitational waves on a medium which is extremely stiff. Mm -hmm. And the power that you have, like you said, is extremely small. Therefore, I maintain that, yes, it's going to try to generate this, but your power is so small that the, that the magnitude of the, which are really, like you said, they are shear waves, the strain, which is what actually is being measured by LIGO, right? The strain is what, 10 to the uh, minus uh, uh, 20, Three, yeah, yes. 10 to the minus yeah, 23. Yeah, yeah. I, I maintain that the, the strain, which is 10 to the minus 23, as produced by binary black holes or binary uh, neutron stars, in this case, if you calculate the strain, is going to be undetectable. Okay. Uh, can I answer now? I, I, uh, I, I wrote um, uh, uh, an article uh, in a book that I I was the editor of, it's called Visions of Discovery. And it's in honor of my old teacher, Charles Towns, uh, 90th birthday. And in that, I wrote an article on precisely this point, okay? What is the strain, say, if you produce a milliwatt of gravitational wave power? I don't have the book with me, um, but I, I'm just I, I'm going to quote from memory, which is dangerous at my age. <laughs> but. 
uh, uh, the dimensional strain for a milliwatt of uh, uh, my, uh, microwave power is tiny. It's 10 to minus 28. But my point in that article is that's irrelevant because we're talking about linear optics here. Okay? And in linear optics, what matters is the transfer function, if you like, in engineering language, between the transmitter and the receiver. Okay? And as long as the uh, optics between transmitter and receiver is linear, and uh, say you have parabolic mirrors that are uh, efficient collectors of the power, then uh, the uh, efficiency of the system of transmitter and receiver can be very high, even though the dimensional strain is tiny, tiny, tiny. It's 10 to the minus 28. But that 10 to the minus 28 carries uh, a, a sizable amount of power, a milliwatt, say, between transmitter and receiver. And th that is the important thing, is the efficiency of collection uh, between uh, the, the optics between the transmitter and the receiver, and not, not, the size, not the size of the strain, which is tiny. Okay, so let's say that, that uh, that's correct and you succeed in, in the detection by doing this, but you still have the fact that you agree that the strain is extremely small, and therefore people start <coughs> dreaming ideas about using this you know, the strain is extremely small, so any idea that people may have, for example, of using this for propulsion, it seems to me they have to take into account that, that although you may succeed from the point of view of detecting this, the usefulness of this has to be alleviated by the fact that the strain is so small. Uh -huh. Well, for certain applications which depend on the strain, uh, this is still True, what Mr. Sornetwil says is hopeless, you know, from an engineering point of view, it's hopeless. For or ap applying anything that uh, requires you to detect or use that uh, strain of 10 to the minus 28, it's just hopeless. But from the point of view of communications, okay. it's, uh, it's not relevant. That's my answer, okay. Any other questions? I would like to hear from uh, Jonathan and Luis. Please speak up so, and stand up, please. No pressure. Uh, <laughs> Just bring up front. <laughs> come up front. In yeah, fact, come up front. I would like you to come up front and answer the questions from the audience. <laughs> please, come on. Come, come up front. I I think it was. Uh, at least I can, I can ask you a question in Spanish. <laughs> I'm reminded by something I think it was Robert Frisbee uh, said a long time ago about things. It's like, I'll let you be the one to get the arrows in your back. <laughs> so, um, with that in mind, being students in this environment is probably the, the safest environment yeah, you can absolutely. be in to throw out yes. um, speculations and conjectures and get feedback on without tainting your career. <laughs> so uh, that would be a great opportunity if you have anything to say or even questions that you have to bring it up. Well, okay. Uh, well, I heard about the EM drive when I read those papers. <coughs> Texas, I think it was the NASA papers that you guys... Eagle Works, Eagle Works. Yeah, Sunny Paul yeah. Sunny yeah. Paul March. And uh, so we just pondered the idea of, can we do, since we work with superconducting cavities, and we saw there that there might be a dependence of the Q factor, so where we're interested, if we can do any experiments with high Q on this stuff. But we ran into the poem that, you know, it seems that you guys use a lot of kilowatts of power, and we're only working with, like, milliwatts. Yeah. So, but... You know, it's something that we're we're open to explore. Can we do any experiments with high Q cavities? Is it Roger Shaw you're doing superconducting? I I th I'm not sure. I'm not. So this is not sort of. Uh, yeah, I, I, I would I like to pursue that. Uh, I heard rumors that Troyer is using yeah. superconducting cavities to look at the EM drive. Is that true? That's true. I don't believe so. I know. Well, Shoyer says a lot of things that <laughs> have questionable um, validity. 
Oh, I see. Okay. And that, that was one of the things that Paul Marsh was interested in doing, but he didn't have the resources to be able to do it yet. So he's sure. Sure, Shoyer patented it, but he didn't report any test results. There's an actual picture. Yeah, there's a picture. But yeah, that's that's it. Actually, actually, uh, well, actually, before uh, Shoyer, which you're right, uh, has not uh, actually uh, even given any photograph or anything about the so whole thing. There's a guy called Guido Feta that has he has an AIA uh, paper describing his experiment on a super con superconducting cavity. Uh, I, agree, I agree with your belief because... Uh, well, I quartered him on that about what's the theory. He's like, oh, that's coming on the website, but we don't have a theory yet. We just have a device, and we have some console analysis to show where the EM waves concentrate, but there is no published theory. Yeah, but they, they, they say uh, it's it's like, a, like uh, McDonald's right now is conducting a test uh, without, uh, without uh, worrying about the theory, right? So let's, let's just be completely uh, open. And let's say, although there is not a theory, I think that uh, Ray is interested uh, in the experiment. But there is an experiment that this guy conducted. Uh, and uh, works. With a, no, 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 no. This is Feta. Yeah. Feta with my works. Stop speaking age No, 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 no. no. He no. Okay. Listen, listen. We're talking about the superconducting <coughs> experiment. Oh, this is different. Then. Guido Feta has. Where is he? Where is he? Or, he, he has, no, he's, 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 in, no, he's in Philadelphia. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Hold it. Let's go. Okay. Ido Feta has a superconducting cavity, which is completely different from their copper cavities. Ah, okay. Okay. That's new. No, it's not new. It's old. It actually precedes the oh. copper cavity. Is it mounted on a force balance? It has. It has not. Uh, no. It's a, no. It's a terrible. It was a terrible experiment that he did in a in a liquid nitrogen bath okay. and so on, and it's and. It's open to work. Yeah. It's also warm superconductor. Yeah. It, it is, it is a, it's a warm it's liquid nitrogen. IPC. It's a liquid nitrogen, so-called uh, superconductor. Uh, I, my assessment is what you measure is just a result of a poor experiment. But if you want to be open and you want to know about an experiment with a so-called superconducting cavity, you have that paper from 2004 from the AAA. And, and so on. And it goes back that far, 2004, that's the 2004, yeah. Okay. And he has, what, and he has a website. I yeah, guess he a has website. a website, website, which is fairly but, detailed. But, but they, again, <laughs> again they are, well, it used to be detailed, and then he took this all out when yeah. they, he went, he's yeah. trying to go commercial and so on, and it turns <laughs> out that he thinks that it's actually cheaper to put the one, the copper cavity, than the superconducting one, of course, yeah. in, in low air sort of things. Yeah. So, so that... He's a nice guy. <laughs> uh, 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 I didn't spell his last name. F-E-T-T-A. F-E-T-T-A. Yeah, like the cheese so, with an extra T. Yeah. <laughs> the, the company is called Canai, like a uh, from yeah. Puerto Rican or you know, such a So that's, that is the radio frequency, so-called superconducting thing. What frequency Look. was he working at? Uh, Feta was working at, and uh, around the superconducting experiment was uh, around uh, 1.9 gigahertz. Oh, okay. So. And uh, and uh, and uh, uh, shorter claims things that are around uh, two to four gigahertz. Anyway, those these are gigahertz so-called experiments. The other thing is is that not on, what you are doing is an optical. Uh, uh, cavity or is it a, a radio frequency? It's a radio frequency. Uh, it is a radio frequency. It's a radio frequency. Okay. Is that you need a superconducting right. system which needs to be a cool, which has a whole apparatus to maintain that cooling. You know, most of the time when you measure these small forces, you're doing them on either torsional stands or a high thrust, maybe converted to annular stands. So isolating where your systematic errors in that very different apparatus yeah. is not only going to be difficult for you to convince yourself, it's going to be difficult to convince anyone else because it's not a standard setup. You know, it's the advantage with those torsional and inverted pendulum stands is there's a lot of institutional experience with them. So you'll have the advantage that a higher Q factor, really all your field strengths get stronger. So if it's, field strength is important, yeah, wonderful. 
uh, you know, and you might be able to run at lower power as a result. Uh, but you know, do you get any nucleation or bubbling in the liquid that you use to cool? Uh, that's one of the uh, differences that we use a dilution refrigerator with liquid free. Okay. So, uh, but then you have the issue of thermal contact. You, know, you still have to have some kind of way to cool down the battery. Um, and the other issue that I lose from refrigerator is that if they, they run off too cooler, that will run to about 1.2 degrees. So, so we measure the, the mechanical noise of this thing. So it's, I'm not sure how much it affects the actual experiments out to, but. but um, so it's a give and take thing. So you, you don't have to use the liquid, uh, liquid helium as they usually do for these experiments. You can just use the dilution refrigerator. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, that's, I don't know if that's an advantage or something. What, what is like a size weight power? Is this a little box? Is this like a oh, so desk? Is the, it a so our chamber is, unfortunately, the, the cooling pod is 200 microwatts, not very high. And so we're living in very low input power. Um, and the chamber itself is about, uh, I would say, workable space, about four by six. So it's pretty large for, for cryogenic purposes. Most people just use cold heads when you, you know, talk about microphones samples. But we can literally like, put like this you know, cup in there. Pretty large sample space. So pretty cool, actually. You guys speaking a lot of the TV now. Yeah, just like, yeah, you. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry. I was like, yeah, I see that, sorry. Yeah. Um, I did have, I did, another question that I thought of was, I know somewhere in one of the talks they mentioned something about um, resistance, and I got the impression that you needed some losses for this plus effect, and that seems to contradict that a higher Q would. I get, I, I cannot, maybe you can go to the microphone. Oh, yeah. This is the best opportunity you guys have to learn how to speak in front of a group. So, you get up in front of the microphone. I can. Yeah. We won't do that. Yeah, we'll just start right now. We'll just start carving. So, in one of the talks, I got the impression that, uh, that for some reason the resistance matters in, in the opposite sense that the higher key would be detrimental to the effect. I'm not sure if one of the talks I saw this, but uh, I, I, I am the guilty party. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, I, was talking, I was not talking about the EM drive. I was talking about the mega drive. Oh, uh, okay, okay. So I'm the mega drive has a very good theory. Actually, it's the theory of J. And that theory is based on energy fluctuations. And I was saying, if you, that all energy is gravity. Kinetic energy gravitates, potential energy gravitates. So for example, if you have a simple pendulum, the, you have uh, the potential energy going to kinetic energy and the total energy never fluctuates. In order to have a fluctuation, you have to have damping, you have to have losses. That's the only way you can have a total energy fluctuation for uh, a system so that the sum of the energy escapes and you have an energy fluctuation. So, it, so for that situation, it turns out that to have the effect, you have to have some damping. On the other hand, the experiment is conducted at resonance, and the amplitude of that resonance depends on the, the Q. And in that case, the lower the Q, the better. So you have, on one hand, that you, you need to have some Q, some Q, and on the other hand, that the lower the Q, the higher the amplitude. When you go through the equation, then you have to ask yourself, well, for sake, how, what is the interplay? How do you the play? And I can tell you, just like uh, Ray was showing that you have a Q cube, you, you, show, you show the Q cube effect, right? Yeah. <laughs> you show the Q cube effect from, from the point of view of uh, when I like the when I the investigation, you, you're in the uh, equations for the mega drive, I don't agree that there is any, any parametric amplification, by the way, going on right now whatsoever. Uh, what there is, is uh, the uh, twice frequency effect that is being used for what you call the rectification. Uh -huh. That, it, when you go through it naively, you, you're going to see that that goes like Q squared. Oh, okay. So then you have the 
the, the Q square from the point of view of the amplitude, and then from the point of view of being able to have anything, you have to have a, a high Q, and you can have a low Q. So the, it turns out that what wins in the end is to have a low Q. So you, you need to have, sorry, you need to have a high Q. So, and so it's for, as I see it, for the mega drive, it's better to have a high Q, but you don't want it to be infinite. I don't understand what you just said about damping being essential for energy fluctuation, total energy fluctuation. Isn't the, the, the energy goes into heat, isn't, doesn't heat gravitate just as well? Heat energy gravitate just like anything, any other form of energy? Yes, I'm just assuming that, that is escaping the, the, the heat that's escaping the system. Well, okay, but if you move the energy out of the system someplace else, then you get a fluctuation without any damping. Correct. So the, then, then I have to take into account, since momentum is, is, a, is a vectorial quantity, right? We have to take into account in which direction the heat is escaping and in which direction we have the, the max effect force. Okay. And then when, we, when, when you go through that, you, uh, as, I, as I see, the, a lot of the heat is escaping radially, and it is uh, and it's axis symmetric, and therefore that that uh, uh, that is not uh, 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 detrimental to the momentum, while the momentum occurs in the longitudinal direction. So, uh, so, so that's that's all correct. But the bottom line is that for the Mac, it was about the Mac effect driver, and for the Mac effect, uh, in the end, you want to have a high Q, but no, but you don't want it to be infinite. For the EM drive, which is what you're talking about, right? Yes. There is no acceptable series as far as I'm concerned. If you want to be open, and again, I don't like the theory of the quantum uh, uh, effect and or, or the Scheuer theory, but I actually, with a very open mind, I took a look at all the series, and it turns out that in the end, the theory of McCullough, which I don't like at all also, which is based on Unruh waves. Oh. Un Unruh waves that have a wavelength of the, of the universe. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that theory of the Unruh waves of McCullough. The theory of Scheuer, which uh, to me does not make sense even at the high school level. <laughs> Of of uh, of Sony for the of the multi-level quantum gravity that is not zero point but is somehow it can go below the zero point. All these theories, when it turns out that for uh, this few effect, they have the uh, complete agreement from the point of view that one that uh, the the force goes like the voltage square as opposed to Jean uh, theory, which is the force goes like the force power of the voltage, number one. Number two, and the experiments are showing this, so completely different between the EM drive and the Mac effect. And the other thing is the effect of Q for my colleague, for, uh, for Sony, and for Scheuer, they go linearly like Q, linearly like Q. So for the, if you accept any of the theories, something like that, or the experiments, they agree that the higher the Q, the better for the EM drive linearly. And and actually, uh, oh, can I interrupt you for a second? Okay. What about, what about uh, Monty Gay's theory? Who? Monty Gay. The Frank. Uh, the Frank. Uh, Monty Gay. Monty Gay. The one that spoke by Sky. I'm I'm curious uh, as your opinion of this theory. You have an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> and on that, I got to chime in that I'm of the opinion that until the experiments of EM drive devices are providing defensible data and some parametrics to see what changes affect what, it's premature to even begin to do theories. And the people who are jumping to conclusion of theories reminds me of the people that like to argue about the Fermi paradox because you can do all sorts of debates and no traceability to any. Um, Okay. So, wait a minute. There are some theories that can't be falsified. Exactly. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 Thank
Um, like you could, you could calculate the, the heat loss or you know, the expansion predicted. Um, why is that difficult to fill out? Why do you need to, to isolate the, the uh, heat itself? How difficult would it be to apply that to you know new setups in order to to examine things that haven't been examined before? Does that make sense? Whoever wants to answer it, but you're the one that was, that was addressing from old specifically, and then I also... Think, I think all things are possible with sufficient time, money, and effort. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you can trade any two for the last one, but it's it's just a matter of there's lots of legacy man hours that have gone into some of the existing thrust measuring mechanisms that we've got to understand what the types of air sources are that come in. So I, I think you could get to the point where you have really good confidence on a new system, but you probably need to do that by testing it on existing thrusters, also that you're pretty confident on the mechanisms of to validate that you really did trace through all those proper thermal drift paths, uh, building up a good thermal model to really characterize all the different pathways for the thermal drift is tough. Um, but you, you could certainly do it. It's not. It's not. Uh, it's not a fundamental impossible problem, it's just an effort problem. What's the current gap between uh, their chamber and the current testing setup that, that is widely recognized? I honestly have no idea. I, I got that it's about this big and it's a small power. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what a dilution refrigerator even is. So. I, I, I just have to say, we, we, we're going to be taking a break in a few minutes, so probably one more but, uh, discussion but, uh, point. Uh, and then we'll I get back. have a question, and I didn't have a chance to answer it, and Marshall is not going to be able to give a presentation, so we got plenty of time. No, that's up to Heidi. This is Heidi. I think so I'll ask him. Jump on with that. I'd like to hear. Yeah, I'd like to hear what uh, Marshall's going to say. Yeah, yeah I'm just, I'm just, we were talking about a 10 minute break coming up soon. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure. Maybe we're after those days, the kidneys actually will be able to come up here and speak to so this is more exciting than talk. So um, um, Mark had an excellent point about theories. I agree with what he said, but on the other hand, we are free to, uh, when there are experiments, to, and there are theories coming up, and there are more than the one we discuss, to discuss them, and they are falsifiable. So. Uh, some of the experiments falsify the theories. For example, this theory predicts the direction of the force of the EM drive. And many of the theories are falsified by the experiments. So that already tells you that if they, if they, if many of the theories are falsified. I can go over, over the details of that. And besides the theories I mentioned, there are other theories at the higher level. For example, uh, the, the theory of Minotti, uh, which appear in a, in a high, much higher impact factor uh, uh, journal uh, using a scalar tensor theory to explain the EM drive, uh, with, uh, and, uh, which uh, um, if you want, uh, we can discuss. Um, so from the point of view, you asked me about uh, Montillet. Mont Montillet. Montillet, Jean-Philippe. Montillet. 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 So, uh, Jean-Philippe Montillier. <laughs> Theory. Okay. I ascribe to von Neumann's uh, the, um, idea of uh, physics. To me, physics is not just uh, posing a theory and equations. The, you, you have to go further than that. You have to have a solution to the equation uh, the solution can be uh, an, uh, an exact analytical solution that is simplified, or it could be a numerical solution. But you have, you have to have a num some solution to the equation that then can be compared to experiments. And then, like von Neumann said, then, uh, and also Feynman says, all that matters is whether it agrees with the experiment or not. And if you have repeatable experiments that don't agree with some aspect of the theory, then that theory is defenestrated out the window and <laughs> you have to go for something else. The, the, at, at the moment, the Jean-Philippe Montillier uh, theory is in a very embryonic state. To me, it doesn't meet any of the requirements of von Neumann. Why? Because there is no solution to the proposed equations. All you have is just some equations 
but they are, there is no solution. He doesn't have any solution to that. So what, what was presented was uh, uh, finite element simulations using FICO, using classical theory. It has nothing to do uh, with the Mach effect or anything else in, in those solutions. And then an estimation, or I would say a guesstimation, but since there is no solution to the equations, to me it's not, uh, not yet at the point at which one even can comment about it. And then he himself said that the, the, you know, there were questions about uh, the comparison with the experiments. Thank so you very much. Welcome. I think, uh, I think we need to go for a break now for maybe a quarter an hour or so that quarter, quarter till.